So thanks very much, guys. I mean, um, so broadly speaking, this is about the thank you economy. We can talk about anything, <laughs> frankly. Let's 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 mix it up a bit. Um, but just brief, but just briefly, um, do we think that uh, uh, that uh, do you think that uh, there's an end to this to, to some extent? I mean, do because um, people are um, you know liking things on Facebook and you know and uh, uh, sharing each other's uh, music and content. But do you think there's an end to that? Do you think people will get uh, bored and tired of? of having to say thank you to everybody and liking your Facebook pictures and do you think that that's a, a, there, there's a limit to this? Well, that's why we have the hell no button, no? <laughs> the hell no button. Um, well, I, I think one of, the, one of the things we're seeing is that, you know, basically the thanking, the liking, the loving, yeah. I mean, that's just, that's just a very easy form of interaction. It's a positive one. I mean, in the end, it's a trick by these companies to, you know, to complete their graph so that they can connect you to a certain object. You know, yeah. that you, if you like the book, they can say, oh, OK, you know, um, Mike has some kind of connection with that book. So if you have a connection to the book and I have a connection to you, then that book might be interesting for me. I mean, this is you know, the contextual graph, basically, that you know, someone like Facebook is talking about. Um, but you know, and they wanted to, to, to be something positive. You know, so they said like and love, but in the end, where it's heading is that these interactions, these links become more meaningful, they become more qualified. We see that happening now with Open Graph, where you, know, you listen to a song, you read a book, um, you watched a movie, uh, you aim at something on Amen. So that, that becomes way more meaningful. I think it's, it's, it's not so much about the, the thank you aspect, it's, it's more a way of uh, connecting between an object, between a uh, connection between you and an object, and that will become more meaningful as. We understand more objects. We understand the connections better, you know, through through things like verbs and or like you know structured approaches like 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 Eamon does. Yeah, yeah. I think it's also, especially from like a startup perspective, it's also very interesting kind of how you can use this social graph of you know of of the data that's being created like on other services, right? I think it's super powerful. You can see like the first integrations like like Airbnb does. You know, they're really meaningful uh, like meaningful platforms that are kind of built on top of like a social graph. And it really adds value if you, if you start using like, platforms like Facebook. And I think that's really, really interesting for startups to, to be able to tap into all that data and knowledge and be able to use that kind of structured data in a, in a meaningful way. I yeah. think for, for us, like SoundCloud makes up, uh, is, is, is made up of this huge uh, community of sound creators. And so you have the motivation of creating something and then sharing it. You want to bring it to the world. And what you're looking for is uh, some sort of gratification or, or feedback. Mm. So I think that's what really drives right, drive the uh, creation. Is like the more you share about it, or um, the more feedback you receive, uh, the better you be the better you get, and the more motivated you are to, to become better. I think it's some you know we see that happening every day on, on SoundCloud, where people started with nothing and uh, basically created their own like uh, career on, on SoundCloud. It turns out that the thank you economy is no, not, really a, uh, not really a thank you economy. It's a way to game users into creating an interest graph to some extent. That's, uh, that's a cynical way of putting it. Thank yeah, you very no, much. Uh, I am <laughs> slightly cynical. No, there's some truth there. And also, I mean, in the end, you know, we see, for example, when people get disputed, um, uh, on Amen, that's you know as much of a, it can be as gratifying. You know, you started something and you said something like, you know, I don't know, this TV show is the best show in you know this this year, and then you know five people say like, hell no, this is much better, and you end up with four good shows. So you've also got your endorphin rush and your utility out of it, even though people said you're wrong. You know, I, I think in the end the gratification comes from people interacting with your stuff, yeah, and the worst is of course when you post something and nothing happens. So yeah, I mean, you know, every service, if, if you want to reward your users in some way and give them a good feeling about posting something, needs some kind of reaction to that content. But it could be slightly more controversial than just you know, this like, ubiquitous patting each other on the back. You know? I think it's perfectly fine if it ends in a discussion, as long as something happens. Yeah, and users get value out of it. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think it's very, you know, it's very clear to see. I think if you're a startup now, it's really a question where do you want to integrate like a like button, right? I think it's really because it adds for a lot of services, it really doesn't add any value. No. And we, we just had a conversation with Facebook like the other week, and they were actually like said, you know, it's better if you guys not use a like button because there's like a lot more meaningful ways how to integrate Facebook, and you get loads more traffic via other things like using the social graph and stuff. I mean, it's it's one of those very simple things. But you really have to think about kind of where, the, where you add value. And I think at the end, of course, the value is for the user. 
uh, you know, so you have to create it as a startup. And I think that's kind of, you just see the beginning of that kind of, how, you know, how internet companies use this social graph in a meaningful way, and which I is more than I like. I think it's interesting that we saw that, uh, I don't know if you guys saw recently on uh, TechCrunch, the, the uh, guy came up with a thing called shit that, what, what's shit that, called? that cray, shit that cray, which is basically saying, shit that's crazy. In, instead of a like button, it's the, that's crazy. Um, that's to, to me, to some extent, basically speaks to this uh, certain uh, amount of, you know, uh, people are a, bit, a little bit tired of having to like things and yeah. stuff like that. Yesterday, uh, I, I talked to an interesting company who hasn't launched it out of Berlin. They're called Fuck We Love It. And, um, and, and they have two things, loving and hating something. So I asked them, so if I, you know, if I love something on Fuck We Love It, then what's the verb? You know, did I fuck it? <laughs> or, you know, because loving is, I mean, that's, that, that doesn't answer the question, right? When you just say, like, I loved it, then we're going to be like, on what service? Well, yeah, on Fuck We Love It. So we might as well just say, I fucked it, right? <laughs> You could say that. Yeah. <laughs> um, they were thinking hard now about their verbs. <laughs> that sounds like such a typical Berlin startup. But um, I think if you if, uh, if you take if you take that notion of you know social social interaction like social currencies like likes yeah. and what etc. Et offline, you know these create these companies create these services. But if you take it offline, you still very much have this uh, you know this very positive attitude towards feeding the the ecosystem and being there to support one another. So this this whole notion of thank you is much more than just an economy or you know a driver for uh, success. It's really like what what the ecosystem makes up of it. It's like this constant um, support. Uh, for one another. Now you guys are very much dealing in the, the digital uh, world, shall we say, and, but you, you're very much this interaction between the offline and the online world. Yeah. Um, Airbnb had a, a big uh, controversial uh, issue, uh, I think it was last year, uh, where a, a woman's uh, house was trashed uh, on Airbnb, her, her apartment in San Francisco, and lost, effectively lost her, her, her life. Um, and m most of her worldly belongings. Um, you're very much in, in that space, the interaction between offline and online. Yeah. The thank you economy can turn bad, as it were. And uh, how are you going to mitigate that risk? Well, I mean, that's, that's again, you know, that's one of those things that, that's one of the challenges if you work with like online and offline stuff. And I think, again, you know, like the way Airbnb reacted to that, it was very smart, right? To do like this whole social integrations, all these verifications, you know, you can see that this person actually has Facebook friends, telephone number. You're trying to minimize the risk as much as possible. Like we don't have like private events in the sense of like Airbnb, so any, pub, any event is open on Gitsy. So that, that's a big difference. But yeah, I think it's like it's all about like minimizing those risks, right? I think if you t if you talk with any hotel, you know, they probably have a lot of these stories where hotel rooms get trashed like all the time. You know, it's it three three times in every year, of, you know, five year existence is you know it's very like, you know it's it's very mi it's marginal. But yeah, it's a big issue, and I think again there you can really use the social graph to um, yeah to verify and to create like a trust network, right? Because that's what it, what it's about in the end, I think. To some extent, there's something interesting about what you guys are all doing, because in a way, you can all leverage each other, each other's platforms. You know, that's the best song ever, uh, the, your graph, uh, his content, uh, that's the best uh, you know, experience I had uh, with Gidsy ever, that kind of thing. Um, is that, that br briefly touching on the subject of Berlin startups, do you guys uh, or hang out in the same coffee shops and uh, swap notes about each other's APIs, and or do you uh, are you pretty focused on building uh, your companies? I, I I would say yes. <laughs> I mean I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean yeah, of course. Like you you learn a lot, right? I mean I think there's like many companies are kind of in the same you know starting phase. Everyone has like a lot of questions about how stuff works. I think uh, there's a very open communication here in Berlin. You know, like founders and also like employees, everyone is very open towards each other, and you can learn a lot. You know, like we, I mean, Gitsy would have looked very different if we, uh, if we didn't have the people around us that you know, like Felix and like David and you know Eric and, and Alex from SoundCloud. Um, yeah, it's been super great actually that there's such an open community of uh, of people, and you can also we really, you know drop in problems. You know, that's that's also very nice. It's not about just about like, you know, helping each other out for the good stuff, but you can be very open also about problems and like challenges that you have. I think that's, uh, that's really great about Berlin. Yeah. Oh. 
Um, I mean, there's no excuse anymore, right? I mean, information is publicly available. There's, there's blogs, there's networks that exist in the city, and um, you know, um, um, the cost of doing you know, a startup has basically gone to zero. It, so now it's really just about like, figuring your shit out. You, know? yeah. just, you, you have to get it right. Um, there's, no, there's no excuse anymore like, oh yeah, I didn't know how to have access to investors, or like, the economy is bad. You know, if you do good stuff and it have, you know, has some kind of traction, or if you have like, a previous track record, you will have access to capital, you will have access to information, you will have access to great guys. You know? and, yeah. and, and I think that's, it's, it, it really just depends. Uh, Depends uh, depends a lot on you know on uh, on you in a way it's become way more transparent you know what service actually works and what what doesn't because basically it's uh, everything's there right I mean 2004 when I started um, I, I Christoph Mayer was the only guy who I had access to who would know these things you know and I had to pay dearly for it to get that information um, now you can find it online or you call someone up and and of course it has to do a little bit with of course there are different cams and and stuff and it's it's how how in every other scene whether it's DJ booking or or um, you know um, um, catering or whatever, or whatever. You, you help each other out and there is certain people that like each other and that naturally sort of gravitate around each other this, this there's no real plan behind this it's just kind of you know how it happens yeah um, you guys are uh, uh, know the, the US scene quite well I, I would say uh, to some extent um, do you think there's a uh, that the US is cognizant of uh, Europe, the European startup scene, or do you think that uh, they're kind of still in this valley echo chamber? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I see like from from the amount of journalists, for example, that come to Berlin now and that write stories about Berlin. I think that's that's been really great. I think you know Berlin in general is like a very international city. You know, most people who live here are not from Berlin or from Germany. So that creates kind of like and you know, that creates an international atmosphere. I think that's also being yeah like. Picked up, I think, in like in the U.S. now, that you know, it's it's really something which is there and it's it's real, and I think uh, you know Berlin is different in the sense that it has it doesn't have like a lot of like senior people. You know, there there haven't been like companies for 10 years. There are not many people who did like exits and this kind of stuff, and but are you know they are there, which is super nice, and I think that's growing and that's really really valuable for the. For the for the community yeah. of startups, yeah, I think yeah, there's actually no, good, yeah, sorry. Uh, sorry, good point about the, the senior people. I think the, the more we can really show our, our you know nurture and, and grow that network that we have here, uh, becomes not only more visible. Europe does not only become more visible in the U.S. for investors or uh, you know entrepreneurs who want to move here, but also for these talents and people that have experience that have gone through uh, yeah. scaling web services like this before, and so balancing like the you know. Uh, companies that, that are on a great trajectory with, with the network and the ecosystem will, will attract these role models um, that come into like, you know, uh, super high tech people who um, you know, have worked for companies like Google and Facebook, etc. And then attract you know, new, younger people to really jump on a, on a train. I, mean, I think they're all willing to take a look these days. You know, I mean, the, the, you know, the, the, the money follows the money. And basically, I think the, the US VCs for a long time have been understanding that you can invest in China, you can invest in Europe. And any company in Europe you know, that has been doing really well, you know, like Spotify or like SoundCloud, um, no one is so stupid to let that you know, opportunity pass by. What, what you're seeing more is that all these VCs are visiting Berlin now, and they're basically going to um, to sort of the you know the people that have a good connection in the scene and ask them, well, show me the good companies. You know, where is yeah. where is that deal flow? And I mean, in the end, I think um, they're all willing to invest here, but they're also all willing to invest in Bulgaria or whatever. They're investing to wherever there's a good mm -hmm. company. And I mm -hmm. think in today's, it's not hard to bubble up, you know, internationally if if your shit works. And you know, it's also not how Alex always says it. It's not hard to cherry pick. You know, if you're an attractive company, you can get people to move here. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, but the, the big difference is that the difference between Silicon Valley and Berlin is real. There is a real difference. It's senior people. It's also, I mean, the amount of quality companies, the amount of, 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 of capital just mirrors that, I think. You know, it's just yeah. there's more companies that are real that you can invest in um, than maybe in Berlin. But the, but the capital is available. It's, you know, so is the information. It's, yeah. Let's talk a little, let's take, change tack for five minutes and talk a bit about mobile. You guys wouldn't really exist without uh, the mo mo mobile platform that you've launched on. And uh, some recent uh, data came out that 98% uh, of iPhone users in the US now have the latest version of iOS, uh, whereas uh, Ice Cream Sandwich on Android, it's, you know, it's very patchy. Um, and you guys got huge amounts of adoption when you launched your 
iPhone app. I assume that you're thinking along the same lines to some extent. Uh, what uh, mobile? It's, it's inter been interesting to, to watch the rise of startups like Path uh, lately, and Pair, and Couple, uh, which are kind of social sharing. Uh, so in the sense that even though we've become used to this phrase of collaborative consumption and the thank you economy and social sharing, it's interesting how it's now going down again into a sort of a more focused fashion. You know, the people that you talk to on Path, for instance, are very, very limited. Um, there's a startup in the UK uh, that wants to limit you to only having 150 friends because that's uh, the, supposedly the, the limit. Um, do you think there's an interesting trend there to, that towards more privacy networks, or um, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you know, I helped my mom sign up for Facebook uh, last week, and it really got me thinking. You know, the last time I signed her up for something was for Hotmail, and we all know how that ended. <laughs> yeah, right? Hotmail. Like, I'm, I'm livid. I'm, I'm yeah. livid. I can't live. I remember worried. Hotmail. <laughs> Um, no, yeah, it's uh, I don't know. It's a very interesting thing. Like I, mean, I, I, I use Path. I really like it. I think it's uh, very personal, uh, very, very personal, and I like that a lot about Path actually. But yeah. I mean, uh, do you have a view, Pete? Uh, uh, I'm sorry, um, Felix. Do you think that um, uh, because really, obviously, o o openness is really what about Eamon is about. Um, right. You don't uh, the, the the little little things, perhaps even sharing just into sort of. A smaller privacy networks, you know. Uh, do you really want to say that uh, this is the best uh, uh, hotel to have an affair in, or something like that? Right. <laughs> I don't know. Um, well, I mean, in general, um, I know I said it, but I recently heard it, which, which was, I thought was pretty good to say um, that in the past, um, PR was expensive and privacy came cheap, and the future, um, PR will be cheap or is cheap, and privacy will be expensive. And it's kind of what we're seeing. I mean, basically, it becomes harder and harder to, um, um, to, uh, to do private stuff um, because the effort involved of doing it and the, sort of the mental cost of thinking about, you know, who should see this and who yeah. cannot see this is higher. But, you know, in general, I, I, I think it's just now what's happening is, is just filling the gap, you know. I mean, for, um, for the, the, whole, the whole, you know, theme of Web 2.0 was, oh, now everyone can talk to the world, everyone can, you know, promote themselves, everyone can become a creator, and, and I think that's there now. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a reality, and now these other things, these more intimate um, uh, interactions that hadn't moved online so far are now moving online, right? Because, I mean, they have, ha they have happened on SMS before, they've always been there, but now, you know, there's a better way of, of, of doing this. So um, now you have things, uh, things like pair. Um, I just think you, 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 you see it happen on all levels. Um, what is not to be underestimated on mobile, I think, is, is the, for apps like Path or Instagram, you know, a lot of it is also convenience. I mean, it's really the utility. I mean, why did people start using Instagram? It wasn't because of the, the, the way of presenting yourself to a bunch of people, because the other people weren't there yet. You started because it was a great filter and upload app at the same mm. time, yeah. right? Um, and then as a second effect, basically, you had, uh, you had social popping up. Um, so I think you have, you know, you'll, you'll have, I mean, if, as a fact, Facebook is public. You know, today, um, there's no discussing, like, whenever you post something there, you post it to the world. It's like Twitter, there's no difference. And with Eamon, we see it the same way. Um, if you have an opinion, um, you might as well state that publicly, yes, there is this case that you describe, but it's very rare, you know. Yeah. Um, if I plan on having an affair, I don't need to post the opinion about the hotel, you know, it's really about something else. It's staying offline. Exactly. And, and I think, you know, but in general, like, it's just you have to make a decision what fits, right? If it's about um, a more intimate sharing, then it's good to limit it to 150 people. If it is about getting the most value for the most people out of it, and if it's something that you state fairly publicly anyway, like an opinion, you might as well make it open. I think that things in between are very different. Difficult, right? Because if we would have to introduce some privacy scheme now where we said like, yeah, and then you can have this thing where you say this opinion only for those friends and that's where it breaks. And this is why, you know, these things in, like groups and Facebook have a hard time working or circles. It's either pretty clearly private and it's a one-on-one -on -one interaction like Pair, which is just a better SMS tool, or it's something that's entirely public. The stuff in between, no one has really figured out yet and I doubt that it works. Mm. You know? I mean, for us, we've, it's always been public. You make your, your sound public or private. It's really simple. You can share it with the world, with your friends, whatever it is, uh, or you can really keep it private and then share it with a select pe group of people, or just keep it to yourself. So this can be um, this can be a producer um, 
uh, in a studio working with a band and then sharing, sharing the tracks privately to work on that, collaborate on that remotely. Or this can be um, one of the Wired reporters, Stephen Lecard, who recorded the, the birth of his son. Right? Just like by putting the microphone, the record app there, uh, having a little bit of background music, and then just having capturing the scenery. And he will never go and share that with the world, but he shared it with you know, grandparents and you know, close, close family. And to him, the, the value of this, of capturing this moment, was in, you know, extremely high. Yeah. And to the rest of the world, it prob they probably don't, don't, uh, don't care about it. Yeah, I mean, it's also one of the things we learned at Gitsy. So, like, so it kind of works like this, right? So you organize, you organize an event, people sign up for the event. Very simple. So we kind, of, you know, we kind of figured out like there's loads and loads of messaging going on between organizers, people booking, and then after, we can also check you know, who's friends with Facebook. We actually see that people are connecting after they've been to an activity and all this kind of stuff. And we kind of realized how social this thing is. So now, for example, we're, we're uh, letting people uh, see who's going to go to an activity, which is super strong. You know? like we showed this to the first people, and they, you, know, you can see like, this cute guy just signed up, or you know, this cute girl, yeah. like, I want to join this activity. That's, it, that's really good. It's really good. I, I, was, it to, is really I wanted good. to book one in San Francisco, and I'm like, who knows who's showing up there? You know? yeah, exactly. like, who yeah. knows who I have to hang out with for three hours? Yeah. I mean, sometimes <laughs> opening this kind of stuff can actually yeah. be really, really valuable for users, too. And that's, yeah. I think, yeah, there's lots of lessons to be learned there, honestly. It's not about like, keeping information. Like, if you, if you are able to use information in a meaningful way that adds value for the user, then it's perfectly fine. Yeah. Um, well, we'll, we can uh, take some questions from the audience, if you would like, uh, in the last few minutes of this session. Um, but uh, let's, uh, let's, let's mix, mix it up a little bit. Um, there's uh, some interesting uh, uh, news happening. I mean, the Facebook IPO is going to be happening soon. That'll create a thousand new angel investors, apparently, um, in San Francisco. W when do you think we'll? S when, when, for instance, we ran a story about SoundCloud uh, a few months ago. Uh, saying that uh, you guys had raised $50 million uh, from a, a big VC. We, you didn't confirm or deny. Um, do we think that uh, you guys are going to become the next uh, uh, big exit out of Berlin? Who knows? Who knows? We still have very much work to do. <laughs> You've, you're, you're, what about, let me turn to, to you, Felix. You're, you say that you're seeing great levels of adoption on, uh, on AIM and Twitter-like levels of adoption I've, I've heard. Stickiness, yeah. I mean, in terms of like, you know, what happens in terms of activity and, and retention is, is pretty similar. Like I said yesterday in this other panel, we, 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 fo we don't focus on the people that don't get it, we focus on the people that get it. And that's, you know, that's what, what, what Twitter did, um, and, and it's a big learning that Florian brought to the table. You know, with, um, I think a lot of startups are very concerned with making, you know, catering to everyone, catering to the person that just signed up, but also catering to the person that is on the service six months. And, and that's a hard thing to do, right? Um, because you basically what happened in places, for example, we, we watered it down for the people that actually loved it. Um, to cater to the people that didn't want to share their location in the first place, right? So we're pretty strict about this. We say, like, look, you know, we're looking at the behavior of people that used it three times. And if those people stick around and if they think it's fun, then it's cool, then we're moving in the right direction. If those people get bored after six months, danger. You know, we have to really make sure that now, you know, and this is what's happening now, we're, like, doing new stuff for them because they've invested six months of their life into AIM, and so they want to get something out, right? Mm -hmm. um, but like, so far, we're really not worrying about like, the top end of the funnel, right? Because we have time, uh, we can do it right, and the important thing is that you create something sustainable where people stick around. You, you see with Open Graph these days, you see too many companies focusing on the top of the funnel, like putting people into the bucket, and then it's actually leaky, you know, and, 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 and people go again. So. Mm. Um, um, with, with the, what was your question? I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> going to say something in a second. If, any, if nobody has any questions or points, they would like to. You've got a, can we get a mic? I don't know if we've got possibly Q and A type people. Do you want to stand up and say your question, sir? And I'll repeat it. What's the question? I'll repeat it for you. Right, okay, I'll repeat your question. Is, is there deeper thinking in Berlin 
Uh, oh, we're getting a mic to you. Sorry. Go. I didn't realize you couldn't hear me. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, I want to say it's great to hear from you guys. I was just wondering, from your experiences and from you, your thoughts, do you feel that maybe there's more of a challenge in terms of thinking a bit more deeply about the products you launch because you don't have this huge consumer market like in America um, as close um, to your fingertips? Thank you Europe. very much. Um, I think that actually, though the, the German market is pretty big, but the interesting thing about you guys is you're hugely international in outlook, aren't you? Yeah, I think it's less, it's, it's less thinking about it deeply. It's about just saying the world is so much larger than you know, the place where we live or the country where we live. So I think uh, a big opportunity here is just say the world is connected, it's, it's really global, and the information flows you know, across borders. So it's a really good opportunity to just go for, for the world. And it's I neither think, an advantage well, or disadvantage. Well, usually it depends on what you do, right? I mean, yeah. if you do e-commerce or something yeah. like that has a logistics fulfillment component, then it's probably more local. But if you have to pick one language that you do it in, that you start with, <laughs> you'd be stupid not to pick English, especially if it's, if it's a more social play where like, you guys have a local yeah. component, right? But like in our case, it's you know, it would be stupid to, uh, to not try to, and in fact, most of our users aren't even from Germany. And, and in, 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 in the case of SoundCloud, the target audience wasn't Germany, it was DJs or, you know, creators in the beginning, mm. no matter where they were, right? I, mean, I, I think, like, Berlin, Berlin in general is very, like, product-focused, which is super nice. I think most startups are very, you know, product-different different founders, you know, design background, interaction design backgrounds, you know, really product focused, that's one thing. I think if you're based in Berlin, you have to think global, you know, from start. And that, you know, like, it really depends on the platform. Like, for us, for example, like, we have to support local payments, right? So we have to, you know, in France, we have to support Carte Bleu. In Netherlands, we have to, uh, to support Ideal, all those kind of things, which is, you know, that's, 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 that's a small challenge. You know, that's not when you launch in the US, where you just have to support PayPal and credit cards. Well, and that's, uh, I mean, that's, you know, th there are some like challenges there, especially like localization, languages, but it's also exciting, right? Because you have to think about this stuff from start. Well, we're, we're just about out of time. Oh, do we have another question? Uh, we, very, very briefly. Hi. Um, I was wondering, do you guys feel pressure that once you sort of... Oh. Go. Okay. So, being from San Francisco, I wonder, do you guys feel the pressure that once you sort of get big enough in Berlin, that you're getting pressured into moving to Silicon Valley just because you get access to the bigger investors and those people, or is it... Because well, we see kind of a trend of more foreign companies coming to us all the time, but do you plan on staying here once you sort of get there, or do you think you have to move? The pressure to move to the US, but yeah, then again, right, the I mean, we're, we're in the US. I mean, we saw you're in the massive, US massive traction in the US, one of the you know, fastest growing markets for us, and we said we have to be present, so we picked San Francisco, uh, the tech place to be. We're a tech company, we wanted to be there. Um, the heart of the company, DNA of the company is in Berlin, and we plan on, on keeping it that way. I mean, um, you have the best investors from California, the best investors from New York, New York but you stay and remain in Berlin. I mean, yeah. Yeah. like what I said earlier, they, they go wherever it takes to invest, you know. They, yeah. they, it, the, those times are over where they say you have to be in a 50-mile radius or something. And one thing that all of you guys share is a connection with Ashton Kutcher, the uh, US celebrity, correct? Who's he? Yeah. <laughs> Who's he? <laughs> <laughs> um, well. Guys, it's the end of our panel. We're out of time and I'm being told to get off. So please thank you. Thank you to our panel.